Ladies and gentlemen, in this Red Gaming Tidicom video, are you ready for a technological duo of destruction? Well, perhaps I might be slightly overselling it, but still, we are going to be talking about PCI Express 4.0 and also Intel's Kaby Lake. So, I guess it would make sense to start out with PCIe 4.0 since it's the quickest of the two subjects to go through. Now, as the name probably indicates to you, it is naturally the successor to the current standard, which is PCIe 3.0. The primary difference between the two standards is one you can probably imagine, memory bandwidth. In other words, it can shift data from the device to the motherboard and in turn the CPU, and everything can communicate much faster by double the speed. And our PCIe 5.0 is also in the works, but there's obviously a lot less data um, well, it, excuse the pun, <laughs> on uh, 5.0 than 4.0 since we're already starting to see the first cards actually released on that. And the first is the Connect X5 1000 gigabits per second uh, adapter. And that has already been showcased to support a PCIe 4.0 times 16 interface. Bit of a mouthful. But in 2017, PCIe 4.0 will be introduced. And this is pretty important for a couple of different reasons. One would be non-graphics card related devices, specifically storage orientated, such as ones which use the M.2 port. Now SSDs are already starting to push towards the PCI bandwidth uh, constraint. Simply put, they can't shove data down the pipe any faster, and this is one of the issues with um, storage. Now obviously Intel are working on different devices and all of the different companies are working on pushing more data to the to the uh, system so that you know you can load data a lot faster but at the end of the day the convoy can only sell as fast as the slowest ship so if you have a situation where the data is being hindered by the um, connection method then you've got problems. Speaking of which graphics cards. Now at the moment, GPUs are not really bandwidth limited when it comes to even a PCIe 2.0 running at like 16 speed. You're probably not going to notice a really big problem unless you've got like a whole bunch of cards running an SLI, in which case you can start having a few issues uh, of a few percent. But once you start getting to like PCIe 3.0, especially on a 16, you're fine. However, Things will eventually change with Volta and Navi and more data being shoved around the uh, system when we start dealing with massive textures and um, compute orientated tasks. Not to mention the fact that multi-GPU systems, now currently NVIDIA are utilizing PC, um, I'm sorry, SLI bridges, which is basically where both GPUs can share data to say, hey, I'm working on this, you work on that. And it obviously depends on the um, methodology or using of multi-card rendering but still essentially that's what the bridge does in layman terms now in a theoretical world with faster PCI connections you would not really require those bridges now I'm sure someone in the comments is immediately gonna say but probably before I even say the words yeah but AMD are doing it yeah that's true they're doing it with crossfire thanks to their proprietary technology however unfortunately GPU creators, that would be the folks making the chipset, so that would be NVIDIA, AMD, are a lot more secretive than they once were when it comes to the actual inner workings of the card. And therefore, I couldn't really tell you why NVIDIA require the bridge. It may be they've not developed their technology quite as much. It could be that their method of um, GPU, uh, I'm sorry, of SLI requires more bandwidth than AMD, or it could be something a little different. We're not 100%. There have been some, you know, information that has been leaked, but unfortunately it's not the whole story most likely, so I can only give you some speculation. Anyway, this is quite interesting, but don't panic. So let's say you've just rushed out and bought a GTX uh, 1080, or you've bought a Titan, and obviously you're probably going to want to keep that for a certain amount of time, but you are one of those folks who want to jump on the latest motherboard standard with the latest processor, well, you're not going to be shit out of luck because obviously PCI 4.0 is going to be back with the compatible, and I imagine it's going to be a similar story for 5.0 as well. So, naturally, it will slow down, so a PCI 4.0 
um, motherboard running with a 3.0 GPU. It's only going to be running at that speed of 3.0. It's not going to be running at full speed because, well, the GPU can't handle it. But you're not going to lose anything. So it's not going to explode, go into flames or, you know, whatever. So moving on to something a little different, the Intel processor. Known as Kaby Lake. So as you can possibly imagine, given the name, it is the successor to Skylink. There are, however, a couple of differences, the main ones being clock speed increases and also IPC improvements. In other words, if it's running at exactly the same clock speed, so let's say for the sake of argument, both chips are running at 4 gigahertz, then you will have KB Lake having around a 10% advantage. Now, 10% is not exactly a massive advantage, and you're probably not going to want to do an entire new system just based on 10%, but it is quite interesting for folks who maybe still have Haswell or what have you and are kind of considering, well, what one shall I uh, upgrade to, whether it's Zen or KB. Now, what's quite interesting about KB Lake versus Skylake is they are changing the chipset to a 200 series. Now, what I'm hearing is that this will not have backwards compatibility with the older generation motherboards for Skylake. So there, Skylake, just to clarify, is using the 100 series motherboards. This is rather weird because the actual physical socket, from what I understand, is exactly the same. It's still 1151, which is kind of, well, confusing, to be honest. And I imagine it possibly will upset a few folks, but that's just how things are going to be running. Now, what we do understand is there are going to be multiple 7th generation Intel core desktop lineup uh, entries. So, the first one will be the Kaby Lakes, which I've just discussed. We have a couple of models that we're aware of, the 7700 and the 7600. You can probably imagine the differences before I even read them out to you. Um, the first is obviously the 7700, which is naturally the successor to the 6700. Come on, say it along with me, folks. Come on. Eight threads, four cores. Now, the primary difference we're looking at, as I mentioned, is the improvements in IPC, but you're also looking at a boost clock of 4.5. The 7600K is exactly the same as the 6600K. The only real difference is that you're looking at 6 megabytes of a free cache, 95 watt TDP, but the turbo is running at just 4 gigahertz, well they're technically saying beyond. What the overclocking potential is for those, I don't know. From a personal point of view, and I know this is possibly going to upset a few people, I don't really think that a 7600k is a smart move to buy especially in the latter part of next year especially if you're going multi gpu configurations there are some usage scenarios where i can imagine that it might be but i imagine for folks who are on a budget you might be better off going with zen and i don't want to turn this into a zen versus kb because we don't have benchmarks of either but personally and once again, your mileage may vary based upon your usage scenarios, but personally, I would rather have, let's say Skylake, I'm sorry, KB Lake is about 10 to 20% slower, uh, sorry, faster than Zen. So just once again, I'll say that again. KB Lake is about 10 to 20% faster. Let's say 15% faster than Zen at the same clock speed with the same number of cores. So one core of KB Lake is about 15% faster than Zen, and I'm not saying it is because we don't know, but I'm just giving an example. If it was, I would still rather go with Zen, because ultimately you get more processor cores and you get more threads. In other words, a 4-core Zen, you get 8 threads, whereas with the 6600K, you're only, I'm sorry, the 7600K, you're only getting 4 threads, which as games start eating more processor cores alive, and they will, especially when you start factoring in Neo, when you start factoring in Scorpio, which is obviously going to be a thing next year. If you're gaming orientated, it just makes more sense to have those extra cores. However, there is arguments to be made on the 7700K. Moving on, we have Intel's S series KB Lake. Now, these are just regular non-overclock. So exactly the same deal. You have the 77, the 76, the 75, and the 74. Obviously, all of the other ones below the um, 77 are i5 related 
So, as you can imagine, there's just varying clock speeds which aren't really worth discussing for the purposes of this video for the average power user. And finally, there is the Intel T-Series Kaby Lakes. These are, well, low power. And they are really aimed at 35 watts and include everything from the 7700T, which is a multi-threaded quad-core processor running at much lower clock speeds. You're looking at 2.9. And then you've got the i5 derivatives. So once again, all of those processors very similar. They're just running at much lower clocks. For gaming folks, however, the reason I've just kind of glazed over those for the average person I imagine watching this video, you don't really have usage scenarios which are going to be indicative of those processes. With that said, you might have someone who wants to use, let's say, the 7600T for a streaming machine, and there would certainly be a very good usage um, argument for that. Intel are also going to be releasing a whole bunch of other processors over the next... Um, year to two years, including the Coffee Lake lineup of processors. Now, Coffee Lake is not going to be released until 2018, but it will increase the number of cores for the mainstream up to six. So you get six main cores, and once again, as you can imagine, um, if you're going with the i7 variants, they will offer um, hyper-threading, which means you would get 12 threads. Unfortunately, as I just mentioned, that is not going to be released until 2018, which doesn't really help you if you're going to build a PC in the next 6 to 12 months, which is really KB Lake and Zen. Now, I don't necessarily know what's going to happen in by 2018. It's going to be very interesting because I'm getting a lot of good feedback from most of you guys and just regular forums that Zen is looking pretty tasty, especially because um, I mentioned in yesterday's video that Zen has been shown on a clock-for-clock -clock basis to be ra basically handling or hanging in there. God, I can't speak suddenly. With the 6900, and that is bloody impressive. Now, obviously, Zen at the moment is in an engineering phase, which should hopefully mean that they manage to crank up the clock speeds a little more. We'll have to see what their tolerance level is in terms of overclocking as well. For example, if you can imagine a scenario where Zen is released at 3.8 gigahertz and it, over, and it only overclocks to like 3. Point, I'm sorry, 4.2 or 4.3, yet you get Kaby Lake overclocking to like 5 gigahertz. I'm just throwing numbers out there. I imagine a lot of folks may well be tempted with the Intel side of things if they've got the money and they don't need those additional threads. But unfortunately, we don't know yet. And AMD, to be fair, probably don't know themselves, even if you were to be able to read their mind like using Jedi Mind Power. And they're probably still trying to figure out what the tolerance is for the silicon and once again coming down to yields. But it's going to be very interesting for PC gaming. Um, I, I, I just, I'm absolutely blown away with the amount of technology which is popping up actually over, over the last like 12 months, and it's going to get better for the next 12 to 24 months. We're going to be absolutely spoiled. I mean, and this is in no real order. You've got Zen coming out. You've got KB Lake coming out. You've had Polaris. You've got the GTX 1060, the 1070, the 1080, and each one of those kicks ass at a different price point. Vega is supposedly going to be released this year, assuming, you know, the rumours are accurate, and if not, it'll be early next year, which is absolutely fantastic. DirectX 12 is kicking butt, and Vulcan is looking like it's shaping up to be absolutely excellent, as we discussed in my exclusive interview recently with the folks over at Kronos, and all of the companies, whether it's anyone from Microsoft, to Intel, NVIDIA, AMD, all of them are working together absolutely fantastic at the moment, and Console gaming is actually pushing PC gaming rather nicely as well, with engine with multi-threaded engines becoming the norm, which is helping desktop PCs, uh, better graphics technology where you're starting to utilize compute a lot more. So it's absolutely excellent. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. For those wondering, I will be doing a full Zen technical analysis. The GTX 10. 70 video I've been promising you guys is actually uploading currently. So barring any unforeseen consequences that review should be up and running do let me know what you think about it i've put in a lot more work um than probably any other review and i've changed the format at least two or three times i've restarted it so hopefully it's it's a good review basically um 
and that should serve as a blueprint for the future. But for now, I'm going to get going because this video turned out to be ooh, about seven minutes longer than what I had originally anticipated. So take care of yourselves. Normal thing like, subscribe, share, you know, give internet cookies, and I'll see you soon. Bye.